My name is Peter Farrago. I, um, it says Startup Market. I was most recently was with Flurry. I was there when it was under 10 people. I was there for about six years. Uh, I was head of marketing. We went through a couple of near-death experiences. Uh, taking some time off this summer, I've got three young kids. Uh, and it's very hard to think about the next thing when you're cranking on the job. Uh, through those, through that experience, though, I do know a lot of these folks either personally or worked with all the companies, and I think we do have a really kick-ass lineup. I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves when you started with Adam at the end from Hotel Tonight. Yeah, uh, uh, Adam Grenier from Hotel Tonight, uh, Director of Mobile Marketing. Uh, Hotel Tonight is a same-day mobile booking application. I know several people actually used it yesterday uh, successfully. Thank goodness. <laughs> Hey everyone. Um, that was probably me, sorry. <laughs> I was just testing my lightsaber. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Billy Ship. Uh, I run growth for a company called iDiction. iDiction develops and distributes mobile applications. We power a platform called Appaday, which is the leading app discovery platform on iOS. We also have a social video and photo messaging application called ClipChat. We've built a bunch of other fun viral uh, photo apps as well. Hey guys, my name is Bill Kang. I run UA for Scopely. Uh, at Scopely, basically our goal is to identify some of the most talented indie game developers out there and partner with them to produce awesome games. Uh, kind of closer to a co-development model than a traditional publisher. Hey, thanks to the Hasselfers team for putting together an awesome event and thanks for all of you for being with us on the last panel of the day. So I'm Alan, I am a marketing lead at Supercell. We're a tablet's first games company headquartered in Helsinki, Finland, but also offices in San Francisco. And we are known for Heyday and Clash of Clans. And I should say, Arlen, you're from Norway. That's correct. That's right. Yeah, I know the, I know the Supercell team relatively well. Worked with them in a prior life at a gaming company. They're, they're an amazing team. Um, so this is about user acquisition. So let's start with um, maybe a little bit of a, I think a day in the life is probably a good place to start. Because I, you know, maybe a little bit about what you think about in terms of, um, you know, imagining other folks either want to know what it's like or, or in the cockpit themselves day to day. I know it's a very fast moving kind of almost arbitrage market type experience. And so maybe, maybe describing a little bit of what it's like day-to-day uh, -day in terms of what you care about, what you look at in the morning, what you're trying to influence. And uh, I know each of you, maybe we'll start with Ireland. I think you have a unique situation with two titles in the top five grossing for what is by far the record um, for, for Apple. And um, maybe you guys are in a different situation because you're in orbit, but you're definitely looking for certain kinds of users. Maybe tell me what your day is like. Cool. So the, the team in, uh, in Helsinki definitely made our job uh, easier by, uh, by building great, great titles that uh, users simply love and, um, and, and stay very engaged, engaged with. Um, then day to day, well, it's all about, of course, um, I think like everyone here looking at uh, what are uh, the cost per acquired uh, install versus your uh, lifetime value. But of course, also um, volume and scale. So that's very important for us. We uh, we're very hungry for volume. Billy, I know that you do a lot of. Uh, I'm sorry, Bill. No we'll go, so, <laughs> Bill, Billy, <laughs> but Bill, I know. Um, I know you guys do a lot more launch-like activities where you're really trying to get something that's unknown, known fast. Yeah, that, that's definitely accurate. So I, I think the way I think about UA for our team is kind of divided into four different pieces. So there's bursting for launches, as you mentioned, where new products, getting them out there quickly, getting a lot of awareness in a very short period of time. Uh, second one being sort of more traditional steady state buying, which I know a lot of people in this room do as well, you know, consistent buying over time, optimizing relentlessly. Third piece for us is to sort of look at innovation, you know, how we can find new effective ways to reach new pockets of audiences at scale. Um, and then the fourth for us is, you know, we have an existing network of users. So cross-promotion is tremendously important for us, making sure that we're doing that in a very thoughtful, decisive way, as well as uh, innovating with how we reach our existing users as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off of stuff both of these guys said. So um, the first thing, you know, scale and performance are definitely the first things that you're looking for. Um, but then once you've got a couple pockets that are performing well and have meaningful scale, you look at things like cross-promotion and, uh, and virality. 
So those are things that we care about a lot because you can re drastically reduce your cost of acquisition long term if you can get really strong virality or people that cross promote really well, right? If you can buy an install for a dollar or a dollar fifty, but then cross promote that same user to other titles two or three times, well then your cost of acquisition went way way down uh, for that user. So those are things that we care about a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I, on the same board for the most part, I would I'd flip it a little bit for our business model. Um, for us, you know, we don't make revenue until somebody is willing to commit to actually book a hotel room, uh, which is a, a pretty significant cost in most situations outside of like Reno. Um, and so, because of that, it's it's really about performance first and then scale. Uh, just because scale alone for an app like ours just it doesn't back out uh, if you go too quick and just over depend on you know, just quantity um, in, in literally hundreds of times less value <laughs> than if you're looking for like a really good quality user. So we're really kind of in the weeds from day one in terms of looking at, you know, down funnel conversion rates all the way through to booking, repeat bookings, uh, the value of the booking. You know, if somebody books a $300 room, they're more likely to book more $300 rooms versus somebody that books a $50 room. You know, so it's really kind of juggling all of those and finding which traffic sources uh, can produce those at scale. Um, and then the second piece is, you know, you guys mentioned it as well, is <clears throat> just balancing relationships with all of the various players in the market. Uh, so really dealing and managing a huge inbound of sales reps contacting us and new opportunities, as well as going outbound and working with companies like Facebook and Apple and Google and uh, Twitter and has offers and looking for opportunities to make sure we're ahead of the curve to be able to take advantage of every new thing that comes out in the market before our competitors, hopefully. So one, one theme, if I may, uh, okay. everybody's definitely focused on top of the funnel. That's sort of where, you know, that, that's your specialty. That's what you're looking at. But a lot of you think about, you know, downstream or, or bottom of the funnel, lower funnel. Basically what I mean specifically is, does that user stick around? What's the retention look like? Do they ever spend? What's the LTV Arlen mentioned? So how much, um, how much do you follow that life of a consumer in your own job? Like you mentioned, Billy, for example, you want to take that user and then later on cross-sell other titles or products to that user. So maybe starting with you, I mean, how much do you actually follow the life of a consumer beyond initial acquisition? Uh, for the, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to go with Billy no, just because okay. I referenced him. But Adam, <laughs> you can go next after that. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, we follow them within our first party apps. It's actually really easy to follow them, right? Like, because you have a uh, device ID when they come in and then you can see whether that device ID activates across other apps. So um, we care about that, that retention profile across the network much more so than just across a, any given app. Um, most of the applications in, in our vir viral portfolio are very lightweight. They, they're not designed to drive short-term monetization, but they are designed to get people hooked in our network. And then as we launch new titles, uh, we can get them back very, very easily. We leverage push notifications for stuff like that. Uh, we leverage you know, price drops and those types of promotions to get people back into the network and cross-promote them to new titles. And, and those strategies have been extremely effective for us um, to acquire users. You know, it, it literally pennies. Adam, you want to? Yeah, I was anxious <laughs> to get involved. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, same thing for us. So we're looking at the entire uh, the entire lifetime of those users. So you know, we still go back and analyze the users we acquired two years ago to understand how they've evolved. We have a very fat, long tail. Uh, you know, and and it comes um, it it's sporadic too at times. So we have a lot of people that you know maybe book their first time right when they download the app, uh, but then they, maybe they don't make their next booking for six months. And so the, the way that we're generating revenue from these users over time, uh, we can generate significantly more from them later in their life than we do at the beginning. Um, so understanding and optimizing the top of the funnel, even after the fact, you know, we're, we're taking the early indicators and making projections on what those users are gonna look like, but we still kind of go back and kind of do a litmus test to see if that is indeed what happened uh, and if we can kind of pull additional levers based on what actually occurred. Arlen, do you want to you want to add to that? Mm, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, we look at LTV, but that is a projected LTV, right? So based on the retention curve, um, the um, the DARPU, and also other um, engagement factors in uh, in the game, we were able to then project uh, a lifetime value and uh, optimize towards that. Well, you, I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> think there's anything that hasn't been said there. So, uh, yeah, just echo what these guys say. 
Well, let me, let me do this. How many people in the audience, um, sorry, my mic is, if it's humming, just you can, or you can't hear me, just raise your hand. But how many people, and I have a big rig in front of me, I'll just come over here. How many people here are in charge of acquisition or heavily influenced acquisition, are, are worried about building a high quality app audience? Okay, so I think that's it. So let me, let me maybe start then with you, Bill, with this one. So what's working? I think most people here are like, okay, power players, I want an insider tips. You know, you mentioned, you know, Adam, you're looking at Twitter, you're looking at Facebook, doing things with a lot of outbound. Like, you guys are really at the cutting edge of finding new sources of high quality traffic. You know, what's working right now? Like, if you could give someone tips to go and try to do better next week with this, what would you say to look at and why? Uh, well, first, I would give the caveat, which I'm going to actually steal from Adam, which is that. Whatever's working now, you can't just assume that that's going to work in the future, right? I think that's something that Adam has said a bunch of times, is you really have to continuously test and just never try to rest on previous assumptions. But that said, um, you know, for us, we've seen really good success with the Facebook platform. It's been a huge part of our spend for us. Um, we've seen good results with some of the video networks as well, Ad Colony, Vungle, et cetera. Um, dabbled a little bit in, in, in the AdWords side. It's been doing okay as well. Uh, those are the main ones that come to mind. Other folks, what, what works for you? What's feeling good right now? What's, or what's developed over the last 12 months that's become a new good source? Um, yeah, I mean, Facebook obviously is, is a really great indicator of how quick this market changes. I think anybody that's spending money right now can <clears throat> probably comfortably say they're spending close to half of their budgets on a platform that we didn't spend any on six months ago. Um, and same thing happened with TapJoy in the past. Like, things go up and things go down. Um, so Facebook's hot right now. Uh, one area that's really interesting to us are what we kind of call lifestyle incentivization. Um, so looking at things like Keep, um, things like um, Jiwire and Travora is a travel company that's doing, uh, where you're actually incentivizing somebody to do something in real life rather than just um, game incentivization. And so uh, the Travora and those guys, they do where like, you're incentivized to download our app to get free Wi-Fi access in an airport. And so for us, it's a really high value user. Um, but coming at a really low cost. And so there's more and more of those channels where I think people are starting to get creative with just real world rewards that I think reflects more on the type of kind of power user that we see as someone worth targeting. Yeah, I'll definitely echo the Facebook uh, sentiment in the group. Um, it's an amazing channel. Um, aside from that, uh, I think publisher direct deals often work really, really well. So I think Chartboost has done a great job building a platform to enable that. But I also think finding publishers that may not be integrated with Chartboost or other platforms and going direct. Like I love to, you know, troll the app store basically and look for things that it looks like that particular app or class of apps or category of apps is going to cross promote really well to uh, my applications and then I'll do a test. And if I like it, I'll eat it all. Like, that's a really good strategy for me. Um, and so I do that a lot. That's something there. Yes, so what's working for, uh, very well for us is adapting the message to the context that is shown and to the audience. So this obviously only then work with uh, networks that are offering you um, the level of transparency you need to understand what is the context and what is the audience. Um, and, and also targeting um, options, so then sh showing the right ad to the right um, to the right person. So you don't have to add anything, but just making sure. Yeah. Oh, you went. You went first. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm rotating it. <laughs> Keep me honest. You're looking at me like, why are you looking at me? Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, I think that was a good segue, Arlen. So. Um, well, let me, let me ask one question I think that's along the theme of where you're headed, and then there's another question I want to ask Arlen. You reminded me of where things are going next in the industry and what you're, what you're hoping will change, but we'll, we'll table that for a second. So um, all of you seem like you do a ton of testing. And so those who do acquisition here, you do a ton of testing too, right? A little bit of spend, see how it performs. So tell me what, how you're set up for that, right? Because it's a pretty fast cycle. If you are trying to find arbitrage opportunities and exhaust them before others in the market find and exhaust them, and I know this is a cav there's a caveat here, I should say, especially having worked at Flurry for so long, like your business model is unique, your user behavior is unique, you know, it's gonna vary. Like these are the lowest common denominator or general strategies and tactics that work, but certainly know your own audience, obviously. Uh, but what, um, what is it, 
what does it look like from a system standpoint for you guys to succeed? If like someone is trying to get into buying at scale at the right price, the things you're mentioning, being able to target, what is, what is that, maybe going back to the cockpit analogy, what have you guys either built up internally or rely on to get that feedback loop? You're ready to jump out of your seat, so I'll let you jump into it first. Uh, I mean that in a good way. I mean, I, I think part of the reason we're all here is because uh, Has Offers has built a pretty compelling platform that enables you to do that. You know, you can use it to track your acquisition, you can tag the key events, you can, you know, measure the value of those users coming in through those different channels and, and use that really as your dashboard in a lot of ways. Um, and then, of course, you want to plug in other analytics providers, you know, like Flurry or, or folks like that. Um, so you can measure different behaviors that maybe don't trigger uh, direct revenue events, but trigger events that you may care about down the road, like social sharing and things like that, that you proxy for things that are, are valuable long term. What's your fast, Adam, looking at you, what's your fast feedback system? How do you yeah, test I mean, rigorously? It has offers, uh, obviously, but um, I mean, we, we use a tool called Looker as well, which we're really happy with. It, it really gives us a lot more of our own raw data to manipulate and do what we want with, uh, rather than kind of relying on a, a kind of cut and paste uh, analytics tool. Um, and so our business is really reliant on the supply side as well. So it, it's a good kind of bridge between the supply and or what we're pushing in from a demand side from has offers, being able to track all those sources, but then also be able to kind of manipulate that data and understand how it impacts and is impacted by our supply as well. Yeah, well, uh, yeah I think the one quick thing that I'd add which is a slightly different angle is that, you know, not everyone's going to be in a, in a position or the right place to do this, but for us, we've actually institutionalized a minimum amount of spend to be constantly testing on new channels. It's kind of less about the implementation side of it, but more so about what the, percent of your budget? Is it a percent of the budget? It, it varies. Um, <laughs> well, let, me, let me ask you this. Is double it, digits. It's double, double digits. Okay. Yeah. So, bigger, so, so I, I imagine 5 to 10 percent in my head. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's substantial. So um, you're really on the hunt all the time. Yeah, just because I think, um, you know, a lot of the people here, certainly everyone on this panel, is not just looking to kind of putter along and build good business and continue to scrape by margins. Like, we're all here for extreme growth, or at least the hunt for that. And so I think, uh, you know, you have to be able to not just out execute everyone else on the same things that they're doing, but find new things before they start to become arbitraged away. Um, and so I think that that's a philosophy that we have, not only within UA, but you know, product, BD, across the company. It's difficult to do, but I think having those institutional guidelines around sort of guiding how we spend, how we allocate our resources in general, uh, has been helpful just to keep us honest as a team. A great point by Bill there. I think it's also important to look a bit past testing this purple button uh, better than the green button. Uh, but rather, you know, taking uh, the, the 10,000 foot view and see um, how can we as a company or as a group of companies um, um, put our purchasing power together to really drive the industry forward, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, more transparency, better tracking, new ad formats, um, anything. And I think many performance based uh, marketers get a little bit too blind on. Uh, on you know the A/B testing and, and too much details, but but it's at the same time we, uh, yeah we, we we do have the power to drive the industry forward and, and we should do so. Yeah, I would uh, just to kind of add, Erlen. Um, I think what's really awesome about the space right now is there's a there's a really good community. Like we we all know each other. <laughs> we interact like. Uh, there's a couple of different forums to be able to do that. And I, I think what's really awesome, having come from the agency, like big brand side of my past, where that existed to a level, but it was really just to go drink together, not actually to like share ideas and things like that. Like we're the ones moving the industry. And so like it, it's not those big brands. Usually those big brands are good like year behind everything that the startup world is doing. And, and I think the fact that Everyone's so open. Like in many ways, the three of them are actually competitors, <laughs> but they're all willing to kind of share insight and things like that. So, looking from the cockpit angle, uh, I think that's actually a really important tool is to understand that like you're not alone, and everyone's very friendly and open, um, and willing to kind of share insights between each other. So don't be afraid to take advantage of that. It's the beauty of working in a market that is growing every day, though. There, it really is a room for all, for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's definitely a rising tide, and all you guys have very good boats. Um, 
there's, um, well, you know, and just, um, uh, so a couple things. I did not, no one planned on saying has offers, that's not a plug. I think you guys <laughs> using this service is all sincere. And, uh, and I'm not with Flurry anymore for the record, so I'm not saying anything that is uh, pro or con Flurry, though I, I'm a big fan for the record personally. And I will say that this is an unusual market. Uh, a lot of the speaking I was doing and the writing I was doing for the last five years was talking about the unusual growth. I think most of you understand it. I recognize some friends in the audience here too who've been in mobile for a long time, especially pre-iPhone era. We have over 1.3 billion smartphones and tablets in use around the world every month now. And that's more than half the internet and that's happened in five years. So there's unbelievable double, double digit growth across a lot of countries and, uh, and still here even in the bigger markets like the US. So it is um, very fast changing. I don't think the brands are able to adapt. They kind of got the double whammy of um, dealing with social, dealing with mobile, you know, the, the brand has really been fragmented across a lot of different um, consumer touch points. So it is a very interesting time to innovate and be entrepreneurial and, you know, have community with folks who are figuring out you guys really are on the bleeding edge. So with that kind of market, though, comes pain, lots of pain. There's a lot of trial and error, stuff that doesn't work, right? So maybe um, not, this is, this is specific ecosystem level, this, this question I'm about to ask, and I alluded to it, alluded to it earlier, but what would you love to see improve? Not specific companies that you deal with, third party providers, because I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot, but what's broken in your sense, or what, what is a missing opportunity you know, to really move things forward and be able to grow that kind of vibrant audience you're looking for for your apps? Maybe I know, Arlen, you had some thoughts on this, start with you. Yeah, I already mentioned um, the need for more transparency, uh, so I'm not going to bore you with that again, but that, that, is, uh, that is very important, um, uh, especially when, um, w when you work the way we do, adapting the, the message to the context and to the audience, and also when you care about uh, the brand, you know, that's important for us as well. It's not only about uh, performance, but it's also about, uh, about the brand, right? And you just gotta be in control of, of where your ads are shown and, and how they're shown. Um, so, th so that would be number one. So we call that brand safe, a brand safe environment or brand integrity. You care about, w you want your ad to be shown in a publisher property that is consistent with your brand. Exactly. Because we're in this long term, like we believe that both uh, Clash of Clients and Heyday, if managed correctly from both a product and a marketing standpoint, has a lifetime of, of years, if not decades, and, and then it makes no sense just always going for these quick wins, uh, with you know, just flashing banners everywhere, and, and uh, you know, it's that driving one, the right time of use, uh, right type of users, and what does your existing, uh, existing players think of that, and uh, is, is that, you know, like sustainable long term? Yeah, so you guys definitely take a longer term view, because you have, you have brand equity that you're trying to build up and protect. Yeah, other, other folks, you know, what, what's really something you'd love to see improve in the ecosystem to help your day-to-day -day life for your company? Um, so I'll echo something that I think uh, Erlen touched on around uh, creative and formats. I think um, a lot of the formats in mobile uh, were brought over from the desktop area. I think mobile banners suck. Like, I don't think they should exist. Like, I think we should get rid of them in most cases. Uh, maybe in, like, news applications and things like that where it's more text-based, like, there's a place for them. But primarily for games and things like that, and there's not really a good place. A lot of time, people are trying to shoehorn formats into experiences that just aren't the right ones. Um, and so I think there needs to be a ton of innovation around that. Um, and then I'm going to go after two folks in particular that I think can do a much better job uh, addressing the mobile opportunity. I think Twitter is actually doing a really poor job um, in terms of providing transparency um, for optimization around uh, install rates. Like I think Facebook's done a really good job there, uh, and I think Twitter's doing a bad job, and I think it's just a missed opportunity. They're too focused on brand, and they should focus more on performance. Um, and I think YouTube is also missing this opportunity. I think there's a big opportunity for YouTube to do a much better job helping to drive mobile app installs. I think both those platforms have the scale necessary, they have the mobile usage, they're just not taking advantage of the market today. Um, I, I think one of the biggest holes in the market is still um, an, an advertising-based ad server. So the ability for me as an advertiser to be able to track at the impression level everything that I'm doing um, and so I can have frequency control, so I can upload my ads once and send them to everybody versus having to manually create tags and, you know, send zip files or Dropbox links to every single one of our partners. It's a lot of time wasted that those tools that have, again, existed in the online space for 
decades now that um, I, I don't imagine would be that difficult to port over. I, I know there's definitely some challenges there, especially when you get into the impression stuff, but just trafficking tools and things to actually make the ad buying process. So if I want to go out and work with a bunch of direct publishers, the reason we don't is because there's only a couple that are worth working for the amount of time it takes to work with them. Has offers has helped in the process of you know us now just having to provide a URL rather than having to integrate SDKs and API calls and all that kind of stuff. But there's still a huge gap in terms of of how seamless the market could be for advertisers versus where it's at right now. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is to, to take Billy's point a little further about like creative creative creativity in ad units. I think there's an opportunity to have more sort of interactivity and richness in those. I mean, I'm very biased because we're coming from a game space, but I'm sure you'd agree, like, why can't these ads be a little more interactive, and especially we're talking about an interface that's built around touch. Like, I don't know if you guys have downloaded the addiction apps that Billy's team has put out, but you absolutely should. They're awesome. I mean, your apps would be amazing in those types of ad units. Games certainly would be. It tells you could even do stuff there, right? I mean, there's a lot of richness there to be captured, and I think that would also help the industry as a whole, the surface quality, right? It's a little harder to sort of to put that nice sheen over your scuzziness if there's like an error. Well, actually, now that, now that I think about that, it could be the opposite direction. Um, but point being, I think there's a lot more dynamism to be had there. And I think the, the banner is just such a ridiculous way to do things. So I'm, I'm the last one to say that a banner is great. But having, again, experienced the online space where rich media took over, and it was just a really bad experience for users, do users actually want, because I guess my fear is that people are going to create these ad units that are much more touch and interactive and everything like that. And now you've gone from interrupting my game for two seconds to interrupting my game with this touch experience that is really just taking away from what I actually want to be doing, which is continue playing the game I'm playing. So how do, I guess my question to you guys, because I, I agree, like I think there's a long way we can go in terms of creativity, but all I hear is interactivity, interactivity, interactivity. And my fear is that it's going to actually create a worse user experience. So I'll just have a little. I mean, I don't think it has to just be interactive. I think one of the things that makes the Facebook units actually work pretty well is that they're they're pretty native, right? Like they they look somewhat appropriate in the feed. I think they could potentially look better, um, but they look pretty appropriate. And I think that's probably the way to go. I think you know you've seen this happening on the web for like the last five years. Native advertising has become a pretty big thing. I think that's going to happen on mobile as well. I think. Uh, games and utility apps, like every different type of application is going to have its own native format, and there's a big opportunity for someone to start creating some of that today. Yeah, I, I, to, ahead, yeah. that's a great point that you raise, and I think, um, no, I, th I, think, I think it's a great point. I mean, I think there are ways to get around that, like autoplay and things like that, but you raise a great point. There's going to be people that take advantage of that. Um, you know, hopefully the industry would shake out such that the publishers that are putting those ads in there yeah. are going to be punished in terms of the ECPMs. But you're right, there's always going to be some of that, and that's definitely a, a downside. Well, this is, this is the issue, though. I mean, I think you raise, so <clears throat> when I hear a lot about people wanting to buy at scale, and I hear about, I want to see, these are the things that are at odds. I want a better click-through rate. I want better engagement. I want that user to have been a little bit more committed to my, the idea of downloading my app, let's say, prior to the click. Like, there are all these things that are competing. There's contradictions. You know, the banner is the most scalable, uh, ad, you know, dumb ad unit, if you will, out there. But at the same time, it's at odds with, especially now, I'm not going to defend iAd specifically, but the promise of iAd, the original Steve Jobs dream, I think, of better advertising ads that don't suck. I mean, it's sort of shown at the right time. It's an interactive experience. It drives, you know, better real engagement and better real intent. So, I mean, how do you guys reconcile, especially day to day, when you're trying to conveniently buy a lot all at once? Like, the advertising infrastructure in the, you know, for context, there's a lot of uh, studies out there. Flurry has done one, Mary Meeker's famous for one, where you show the time spent by consumers across different media, film, television, radio, online, mobile. You, you see that lots of folks are in mobile, but then you see where the dollars are being spent in advertising. And it's like a huge gap. It's this massive advertising dollar gap. And so you guys want better infrastructure. You want better scalability. Yet at the same time, you're at odds with, you know, is that going to really help me attract and keep the right user? So how do you guys reconcile those competing demands? 
to I'll go military style, just call someone. <laughs> so y you want us to reconcile the scalability plus the how do you balance how do you ba how do you balance uh, getting sort of like easy, efficient buying at volume versus you know really micro targeted get that exact user you want, whether it's through ad formats or through targeting or whatever you're doing to get there. I mean, I think that's still the, the opportunity to be solved, right? Like, um, it, it's early days in the mobile space, right? And mobile advertising for sure. So I think that's an area where people should be actually actively working. There should be more companies at attacking that opportunity. Um, yeah, I don't think it's an easy problem, right? Like, uh, but first you have to have a format that works. And if you look at the, the click-through and conversion rates on mobile banners, like generally they're really, really, really bad. What about interstitials? Interstitials are better, but and trailers, video trailers, so the trailers are better, better, right? So there are formats, right, like that improve upon what's happening with banners. So some of the formats work better than others, but I know you can get better performance. Like I know native units can perform better. Like the conversion rates on Facebook ads are usually really, really good, um, and typically you don't see that with other formats. Um, so. Yeah, I think there, there's an opportunity to continue innovating around those formats. And then for those companies with scale to then work together to standardize on you know, certain creative sizes, on certain creative elements, length of text. Like, uh, lots of different platforms do this. And there's no reason that the industry can't work together to make this happen. I actually think you brought up a couple of good points with Facebook and, uh, and thinking about the Mary Meeker stat and, and just the various stats out there as far as like the low spend in mobile. If you actually think of online and where most of that spend is, the bulk of it is search, right? The, the least sexy ad out there. But that's where the bulk of that money is being spent and very little money is being spent in search on mobile. Uh, it's growing because of the enhanced ads, <laughs> um, but there's still a big opportunity there. And if you think of that ad and then you think of the Facebook ad, it's actually a really simple ad. It's not a big flashy banner. It's not something super engaged. Uh, so actually, I think your point in terms of people creating native advertising could be that opportunity because there's ways to scale. You can have three or four native ads in a page that look like it's part of the experience and it doesn't necessarily like upset the user to the same degree that putting five banner ads on the same page would have. Uh, or <laughs> especially five flashing well, that's banners. That's interesting because you're taking a, a supply side or publisher point of view there, right? Where you're worried about the user experience, where uh, you're worried about the experience the user is having in the app they're in before they're shown your app. Mm -hmm. So how much do you really care about that? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I, I care a lot just because. And, and why is that? I mean, this is, I think there's an interesting kind of advanced yeah. nuance question that guys who do it day to day really get, but, but maybe explain why you think about the supply side so much. Yeah, I think there's, um, and, and I, I'm sure there's stats out there either agreeing or disagreeing with this, but I think inherently when you have an ad on an app or it's anywhere, um, there's, there's this feeling that the user's gonna get that that app that you started with is the one endorsing the app that they're being driven to. And so if I'm being endorsed by crap ads or by bad app experiences, um, the people are like, if I go in and, and the first thing I get is an ad, I already don't like the app that I just opened because I haven't even experienced it yet. And now I ha also have a bad association with Hotel Tonight because that's the ad that I got. So if I've been having a really good experience, I'm reading about my you know, friend's dog, and then all of a sudden, a, you know, an ad for Hotel Tonight, I've at least got some positive association going into the app download experience. So, so yeah. how much are you guys, I mean, Arlen, I know you mentioned you really care about you know, the brand integrity. Um, sometimes called brand safe. So I get it. So you don't want a user that will have a negative perception about your product before they even get a chance to really check it out because the ad was shown in a in poor context, let's say. It was, mm -hmm. it was forced and disrupted their experience. But Arlen, how do you think about that? You mentioned you probably, you know, with, with, the, with the brands you guys, you know, legitimately have and are continuing to build, you probably have the most at stake worrying about that consumer experience. So how do you guys, I don't know, I don't know if police is the right word, but try to enforce or, or what guidelines do you put in place for the kind of buying you do and where your ads show? Yeah, so number one is, is building the infrastructure that uh, allows you to get that data, whether it's site ID or game ID, and, and, and get it in, uh, in, in real time, right? So uh, for us, um, this would be my opportunity to give a shout out to Hassel first then. Uh, mobile app tracking has helped us uh, there a lot. And uh, we actually only use them for install attribution and it feeds into our own internal uh, tracking tool. And then you will there see, uh, you know, these are my um, the advertising networks, these are the publishers, these are the sites, the, the games. 
um, the creative ideas and, and optimize based on that. Um, and um, yeah, by, by only working with, the, with channels that offer that kind of transparency, then um, um, you are able to police it uh, yourself in house. So, so that makes sense. This was about the community thing. I think Adam, you were talking about the standards, or, or maybe Billy, you mentioned this. There'll be an emergent behavior among those who spend a lot of money in this channel, where you say, "I need transparency in order to continue to buy more," and so that'll basically tell the service providers, "Hey, this has now become table stakes." If that if that sounds right. Yeah. So, there are other folks who balance kind of that scale versus quality thing. Other comments around that. Because I have one more question that, uh, before I open it up to Q and A, and so let's say you are replacing yourself at your company, and you're looking for the ideal candidate. Who you know? What skill set do they have? Maybe even their temperament. But and I'm I'm kind of this is sort of a veiled question to help people who are either doing acquisition or need to manage acquisition. What do, should you look for? Is it someone who used to be a day trader? Do they love <laughs> fantasy sports? Maybe starting with Adam, you know, what would you look for if you're trying to replace yourself? What do you think is required to be excellent at the job? Yeah, um, so not to be overly specific, but I've done it already. Uh, so I hired somebody from a search ad agency, uh, and I actually think that skill set is really great for this. You know, finding somebody that has no mobile experience, but has a really key knowledge of going in and optimizing campaigns and digging into the dirt and finding opportunities constantly on a daily basis is a skill set that's really needed. And he knows the language, right? He understands cost per click, cost per acquisition, all, the whole funnel part of it. Um, so mixing that with somebody that fits into your culture, I think is uh, just it's advice I've given since I've hired that person and uh, I, I stand by. I think that's a good mix of what's needed right now in the marketplace. So, so other folks, what, what, are the, what are the killer skills, experience? What, what do you look for if you had to replace yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, so I look for uh, folks that are just basically analytical, you know, comfortable with numbers, spend a lot of time with numbers. Um, people with good negotiation skills who have negotiated deals and contracts before because that's a lot of what you do. And then manage relationships because a lot of these are partnerships that you're going to have for a long, long time. Um, so it, it, those are kind of the, the three things that I'm most interested in. Bill, you have yeah, um, looking for a Gemini, Sagittarius. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Like long, uh, long walks I, on the yeah, beach. Exactly, <laughs> long campaigns on the beach. Um, I mean, there are so many things, right? But if I had to pick two, I think I would want someone who has both the ability to dive down deep into the numbers, but also to sort of very quickly, instantly flip and look at things from 10,000 feet and sort of have the ability to, to make that switch constantly day in, day out, because I think that that's kind of, in my mind, the, the, the most important quality. Yeah, those are all great points. I agree to those. Um, Supercell, we are hiring now. So there are several <laughs> open positions in the marketing team, player acquisition, marketing analyst, uh, even more. Uh, go check out uh, Supercell and slash jobs. Um, <laughs> And then That's what kind uh, of people supercell.com slash jobs, you said? Uh, yes. Oh, just checking. It. Yes. <laughs> uh, what kind of people are we looking for? Well, um, our latest hire is right there in the front, so you can just go and talk with him, and then you get an idea of uh, Jimmy Lee. I think he's pointing at this guy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not trying to point you out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, um, it's so much about uh, relationships, right? I believe was you were mentioning that, uh, Billy. So uh, having the right kind of personality uh, is, of course, uh, important uh, to be able to nurture and, uh, and um, manage uh, those important relationships of ours. Um, also, intellectual curiosity, um, not accepting status quo and just, you know, this is my LTVs that allow me to buy traffic at the CPI, you know, that's great, but going a little bit further and, uh, and like, uh, how can we, you know, bring our uh, marketing um, and player acquisition efforts to the next level? How can we drive the industry forward? Um, seeing the bigger picture is important, as Bill mentioned there, uh, but at the same time, uh, still being able to, to uh, like dive into the data and just uh, you know nerd out in front of the computer in the afternoon and really like you know dig into those numbers. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's 
having that having the, also the vision and strategic thinking but at the same time being able to dive into the data and, and being hands-on those are all important yeah I mean it sounds like a broad skill set actually it sounds like it's not easy to be in a fast moving industry in a fast growing industry when there's a lot at stake you know I think I you know was thinking that you know a small mistake is blowing your budget too fast a big mistake could be spending your company out of business you know, like it's, there's a lot at stake. It's a, it can be, I'm assuming, pretty stressful. But a big mistake would also be um, not seeing the opportunities that are out there, being too cautious. Um, uh, and um, as I said earlier, also like just doing, you know, what everyone else is doing and then losing another opportunity. Right. So, so there is a amount of risk taking and, and thinking beyond that you constantly have to do, that intellectual curiosity you talked about. I want to make sure, if, uh, what kind of questions, if you don't have a question now, think of a question, but is anyone, is, is there a burning question? You've got some great panelists here, so you should take advantage. Uh, my name's Eric Dick from Tap for Tap. Uh, hey, Bill. Um, I had a question about uh, programmatic buying and RTB. Is that something that you guys are actively pursuing right now? I, I think it, 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 there's a real opportunity to be able to buy further down that funnel and, and, and find very specific kinds of people. Is that something that you guys are doing, or are you sort of relying on uh, other other third parties in order to do that on your behalf. I think everyone heard the question, but does everyone know what real time bidding is? RTB exchange, it's buying, you know, programmatic buying. Okay, anyone who maybe you don't. I'll say in case you don't, I don't make, raise your hand if you really don't know. But it's kind of like a Nasdaq, an auction system where you're bidding, you're putting bids in for the kind of place you'd like your ad to be shown, right? And so it's it's computer to computer. You get on an interface and you buy in volume. Uh, kind of thing. So it's not the direct relationship stuff that mostly is uh, being done today. And the idea is you take the remnant inventory, what's called unsold or remnant, you add data to it, it makes it more valuable for the rest of these guys to buy in large blocks. So anyway, uh, so the question was how much are you maybe using it? Uh, is it affecting your job yet? Is it in the market? How good is it? Yeah, we're, we're using it. Um we're seeing more volume there than uh, what, it's, um, what it was earlier. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely an important channel for us. Um, we have partners to manage that for us, though. We have a very small and lean team, so we're, we have to rely on, on, uh, on our partners for that. Other folks, RTB exchange stuff, programmatic? Yeah, I've tested RTB in the past and never had a ton of success for, with it on mobile. I've had better success with it on the web back when I did more web acquisition. Um, I think it's still a, a, a format issue. Um, like I, I just don't think a lot of the formats that are being exchanged at volume uh, via RTB channels are very good. And you know, to your point around the, the remnant channels, I'm not sure a lot of the data signal is there to actually bring the quality threshold to the point where it needs to be. Um, so I haven't had a ton of success with RTB. Yeah, we, we do a fair bit through different you know, DSPs and other partners. Um, and, and we're working right now with some of the exchanges to potentially do a little bit of it direct ourselves. Um, but that being said, I, I think the, um, the marketplace as a whole still has a ways to go in terms of being on par with what we've seen in the online world. Um, you're still, for the most part, just bidding on a click, not an audience. Um, and, and so there's a ton of audience data that's finally starting to surface that makes it a little bit more valuable and worth the time and effort. Um, but until that quality and scale is really there, it's hard to justify putting I mean, it takes a lot of time, right? It's, so to commit any one person in-house to it, uh, I, I don't know that the market's ready for that quite yet. It's close. Other, other, so, okay, I know we had a question in this vicinity. Okay, you're at it, you're on it, good. Yeah, my name's Scott from Appia. Um, my question's around data optimization from the ad network publisher side. Um, there's really two ways to go about it that are happening now with you guys passing this post-install data and us optimizing off of it versus us passing you, say, side IDs for you then to pick and choose which ones perform better. Um, which do you prefer? Um, me personally, you being my customer, I'd like to do it on my end. But the second part to that question then is, people are willing to share data now, and do you see that changing in the future from your side to Ad Network's publishers? Can you just give an example maybe of the kind of data you're passing um, back and forth? That has to be passed back and forth? Post install data, so pass the install, any event that you register as a good quality user, passing that to us, or us passing you, say, side IDs, and you saying this side ID is good, this side ID is not, et cetera. Okay, good. Okay. What do you guys think about data being passed back and forth and who should be responsible and so on and control it? 
You go, Alan, when we have yeah, strong uh, opinions on this. The more, the merrier. I mean, I'm not, I, I would rather just have every piece of data that's possible, um, and I won't use it all, I'll be honest, but having it and having access to it at least gives us insight into what we could be digging into, and at times we're gonna dig into that and test it, but we won't rely on all of it at all times. Um, but I think part of your question too was, there is some openness to share that now, but will that change? Will people get more like close knit about their data? So for instance, us being able to like, I'm passing back, you know, booking information, like how much someone paid for a room and things like that to my publisher partners. Um, I, I think you're gonna always have some people that are paranoid about what is being done with their data, um, but I think your more savvy advertisers are gonna understand that the more data I share with you and the more data you share with me, collectively we're gonna to come to a better conclusion on who we should be targeting. Um, so I, I think it's gonna kind of stay middle. Uh, some people will, some people won't, but I don't think it'll change drastically one way or the other. Other points of view on that? Anyone? Yeah, I agree with Adam. I think the, the more data, the better. Um, I think, you know, I think I'm probably the only one who hasn't said something good about house offers at this point, so. I love house offers. <laughs> I, really, I really do, though. I really do. Um, and it's made it really easy for us to share that types of data with people. Um, I think one thing that we've looked at doing with some of our, our publisher partners is not necessarily passing uh, actual values, but uh, relative values. So there's some, uh, you know, some masking, but we can still communicate and work together to optimize, and it's worked well for us. Thank you. Uh oh. Oh, so uh, Jimmy here. Um, the panel is called Mobile Advertisers and Growth Hackers, and I think you guys have done a really good job of addressing the top of the funnel. Um, but something that you guys haven't talked a lot about is like deeper in the funnel. How much influence do you guys have as mobile advertisers to actually affect the product itself, um, the feedback loop to give it to your product teams, to be able to maybe focus on conversion rates, doing something in the game, or like Hotels Tonight, for example, mm -hmm. like changing the landing page or changing buttons there. Um, and do you actually think about that and uh, sort of what's the loop and operating process there? That is a great question because it's a virtuous cycle, right? It's all interconnected. You want to get the right kind of user who then does Jimmy, right? Does the kind of things that Jimmy is expressing are important. So how, how much do you guys influence in the vein of growth hacking, you know, tuning that product? Yeah, I think I'll let them speak more because I think all three of them probably have more experience doing it. <clears throat> but it's, a, uh, it's something we're, we're doing more now. So uh, six months ago, I would have said very little. Uh, again, because we're a very supply-driven company. Um, but the, we've kind of developed a growth team, essentially, that crosses a little bit of marketing, a little bit of supply, a little bit of engineering, a little bit of design. So, um, yeah, so it's becoming more and more part of that. Uh, but right now, it's not a huge part of my role. So it's, it's something that I play a pretty big role in. Um, at iDiction, we have zero product managers. It's all just engineers and everyone else. Um, so I work directly with the engineers building the products. Um, so I don't have final say over what they build, but I definitely uh, influence them as much as I can uh, in terms of things that I care about in terms of growth. Yeah, at Supercell, um, anyone can call with feedback to any team. Um, just by the nature of marketing, um, having access to so much uh, data and looking at it on a daily basis. And of, of course, we do come with suggestions uh, to the product teams when, when, um, when that's um, appropriate, or it could be feedback the other way as well. And you know, we uh, um, our office manager, she was very helpful when we made our first live action um, spot for Heyday. She had some very strong opinion how, how what that l should look like, and it ended up performing very well. Um, the community manager wrote the script, uh, a poem. He's a poet on, on the side uh, for for another spot. Uh, that was also for Heyday. So, uh, so so sure. That's great. So how much you get in PRD? I, um, <laughs> I I work pretty closely with our product team in terms of optimizing sign-in flows, um, you know, all that, thinking about the pacing of things, how much friction we're adding there. But I'll be, I'll be honest, I work with them closely. I think they drive 95% of the effectiveness. <laughs> um, it's more that they sort of consult with me, and um, I think their insight has typically been driving the real change there. Uh, but the other side of this is, as I mentioned earlier, for us, you know, we have a network of games, so um, cross-promotion is a huge part of my job, and driving that innovation is very squarely in the UA camp as opposed to the product camp. I know we have room for, for at least one more question. Right. I, I haven't heard any talk Should, about, yep. I, my name is Steve, I haven't heard any talk about the value of a customer in a different app store on, on Android. 
So, um, you know, for instance, you, you can't ignore the number of Samsung devices that are out there. I've heard also that the, the, uh, the value that you'll get from a, uh, a user from the Android is, uh, is much higher even than, than Apple, although you don't have the volume. But with possibly the upcoming launch of, of, uh, of Amazon getting in, in, inside of um, uh, becoming an MVNO and, and selling their own handsets, there could possibly be a great growth there. So I was wondering, do you guys have any opinions about or knowledge of uh, users from those different app stores and possibly how much, uh, you know, what percentage you may, may spend towards those? Yes, yeah, so I, think, I think it's a two, uh, it's got multi-dimensional aspects. So one is uh, iPhone or iOS app store versus uh, Google Play for Android. And then I think even within Android, uh, he was referring to certain OEMs, like is a Samsung user worth more than an HTC user, perhaps, uh, that's using the OS? Um, yeah, so for us, um, the, the hotels are the same. So the, the opportunity for revenue is the same on both. Um, we have seen, as a whole, our Android users are a little bit lower lifetime value. Um, but when you get to the handset level and you drill into uh, you know, the latest devices, the devices that people have the, the latest OS on that, you know, taking out like the, the Virgin mobile phones or things like that, it, that can equalize pretty easily. Um, and I think where it's starting to get really interesting for us and will only become more so as we go international is you've got countries like Germany where, you know, we see on Facebook, um, like Facebook's mobile audience in Germany is like 80% Android and 20% iPhone. So there's obviously, even if the value is a little bit lower, like you said, there's tons of scale opportunity there for it. So um, as a whole, we're spending a bit less on Android right now, um, but that, that could easily change if the opportunity is open for us to see ROI positive ad buys. Other guys, maybe, you know, tied to disposal income or affluence of that user or country by country or store by store, how are you guys seeing differences? Yeah, I can jump into this one. So, you know, for us, ad revenue is actually pretty substantial part of our overall revenue. Um, and we've seen that be really strong on Android as well. So we almost, uh, I know this is an oversimplification, but we, we try to get away from thinking about, well, assuming you've already baked the strategic idea of wanting to be on all those platforms, from a UA perspective, we try to get away from using Android or iOS as sort of this singular indicator that guides our spending and really just look at it in an ROI perspective. So we have plenty of pockets of Android traffic that outperform iOS traffic. But to si the simple answer to your question would be overall, I would say iOS for us has performed better. But we really try not to let that trip us up and guide our spending. Because for us, at the end of the day, it should be driven by the ROI. Arland, um, you guys are such an international brand, right? How much do you look at Android penetration per country, or yeah. iOS and the LTVs per platform and country, and so on? So I have very little to add to that discussion because we are iOS only. So yeah, it uh, <laughs> makes, makes it simpler. Yeah, that makes me look like I haven't done my homework. I knew that, actually. <laughs> I actually knew that, so, uh, uh, well, I guess I did for a moment before. Sure you did. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I take it back, I totally blanked. Uh, I've got uh, one more question for you guys. Um, we've been talking a lot about deeper into the funnel. Um, and as you're working with many different advertising partners out there, you've been spending CPI like gangbusters and doing a great job of optimizing on the LTV. But how much do you want to start compensating based on deeper funnel activity? And are you doing that with partners today? So are you paying per sale or paying per registration? And what does that look like? And how do you think that's going to evolve over time? Obviously, we care about that with our origins in the CPA world. Uh, so interested in all your thoughts. I want to spend all my money <laughs> based on the revenue it generates. Um, so yeah, if that, right now it's almost all CPI or CPC. Um, there's a couple of tests that we've done where we're, you know, paying out on a registration or a booking. Um, but it's actually something we're putting a lot of focus and attention on right now to see if there's, uh, you know, a potential model that's a bit more publisher friendly um, that they'd be comfortable with to, to actually achieve like a true CPA. Yeah, I think this goes back to Peter's questions earlier around, um, uh, around uh, efficiency and scale. Like, I think there are real challenges just buying on a CPA. Like, buying on a CPI is something that's, you know, a little bit challenging. Like, you guys have made it a lot easier, but it's a little bit challenging. And pushing for CPA across all your channels, I think, would be much more difficult to negotiate and manage. Um, 
So uh, I like the idea, but uh, I don't think it's easy today. But so. as a community, we can do it. Yes. <laughs> you have the power. Yes, we can. Yeah. Other, stuff, other guys, anything? Maybe I'll let, let you guys wrap up with final thoughts. Uh, you know, if there's anything you wanted to give advice about someone, you know, let's say imagine they were just starting out and you wanted to say, here's one thing to always keep in mind when you're doing your job and trying to build a quality audience, what would that be? Make sure you have a great product first. Uh, yeah, we talked a lot about, uh, no, but I think a lot of companies, um, app developers, game developers forget this. Uh, it really all boils down to the, to the product and uh, you need to measure your attention, engagements, monetization metrics, and only when they are at you know a certain level, that's when you can even start thinking about marketing. So you know, start at the right end. That's my advice. Uh, so you know, everyone talks about how everything should be LTV driven and ROI driven, and that's great if you have the luxury of having you know, robust, legitimate LTV calculations, and not everybody has that luxury. Certainly, you know, Scopely, we're not that far removed from being in a place where we didn't have a lot of that data. So what I would say is to, you know, take an honest look at where you are at that point in time in terms of the type of data you're collecting and do two things. One, make sure you're making the best of the data you do have. So if you only have install data and you don't have post-conversion, optimize to that. If you do have the ability to do the robust LTV stuff, do that. So be disciplined. And the second thing I would say is to take that step back and say, where do we want to be three months, six months, 12 months from now, so that we're making these decisions better and to be constantly doing both of those things. Um, and so, you know, if you're just starting out, do what you can, but be thinking a few steps ahead. Um, I guess my piece of advice would be to start really, really simply, right? Like don't try and do too much out of the gate. Um, it's easier if you focus on one market, one segment, one product, one event, like it, start there, like figure out like what is that key thing for you and then start expanding from there. You know, you don't need to do lots of different creatives and lots of different targets and lots of different events like all right out of the gate, like start simple, figure it out and then iterate from there. Um, so I'll split it. So if you're on the buying side, my advice would be be ready for a lot of salespeople to contact you. <laughs> and if you're on the selling side, sell me, don't just email me. Actually position yourself and why you're good for Hotel Tonight, not other travel apps, not other apps, but for Hotel Tonight and why you specifically should be working with me. Uh, just because there's so much noise in the space right now and there's a lot of bad noise. Um, so just be ready to actually pitch rather than just give me an IO. Right on. Well, I'm going to hand it back to Peter, but not before, making sure we give these guys a great round of applause. Thank you for your insights.